There we go. You know, you can see me. You really want to see the slides. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Uh, You're fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I am not a role model. Although I have written some interesting stuff from time to time. Um, today I'd like to talk about some of the ideas in my new book. Now, I realize that this is a terrible marketing strategy. Because there's a good chance in an hour from now you'll be saying, well, that's a book I don't have to get because I already know what it says. Um, which is pretty much the story of my life, but there's no need to trouble you with that. So let me begin with the title, Tales of the X-8. Some people have suggested that this is a clever pun, there we go, referring to the absence of a tail as the defining feature of the classic superfamily hominoidia. No, it's got nothing to do with that. Others have suggested that this is a clever pun on the concept of exaptation introduced years ago by Stephen Jay Gould and Elizabeth Verbo to denote features whose contemporary use and value differs from that which the feature initially possessed. No, it's got nothing to do with that either. Uh, this is an exploration of meaning in human evolution without paleoanthropology. So I'm not talking about the foot of Australopithecus sediba or the supraorbital torus of Homo erectus. I want to talk about who we are and where we came from. I'm talking about origin myths. I'm talking about kinship. I'm not talking about human evolution. I'm talking about how we talk about human evolution. So let me start you off then with a sort of epigraph by Carlton Kuhn. Kuhn is not remembered fondly today because in the early 1960s, as president of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, he was secretly colluding with the segregationists, giving them preprints of his book, which purported to demonstrate that the reason that Africans were economically and politically subjugated by Europeans is that they hadn't been members of our species for very long, because whites had evolved into homo sapiens 200,000 years before blacks did. And I'm happy to say that most of his contemporaries smacked him down. And in particular, he got into a heated exchange with the great fruit fly geneticist Theodosius de Janssen, who I might add, was a member of the American Anthropological Association and had many close friends in the field. And Kuhn finally replied, and this is the one thing he said that I agree with, and it's important, were the evolution of fruit flies a prime social and political issue, Dubjansky might easily find himself in the same situation in which he and his followers have tried to place me. This isn't fruit fly evolution. It's human evolution. And it's played out on a far broader intellectual terrain than fruit fly evolution is. It's a biopolitical terrain, as Professor Kuhn realized as he precipitously descended into scientific obscurity. And the nature of the biopolitical turf stems from the fact that this is indeed not about who fruit flies are and where they came from. This is about who we are and where we came from. Now, there are scientists who study the things that people believe about who they are and where they come from, and how they use those beliefs to structure and create meaning in their lives. We call those scholars anthropologists. <laughs> And although we have from time to time turned the reflexive gaze upon ourselves, one area that's tended to escape much analytic scrutiny is human evolution, with possible exception of Neanderthal gender issues. Interestingly, primatology has been the subject of some science studies work. Uh, the one on the left there, the famous one by Donna Haraway, in the middle an edited volume in which both she and Bruno Latour have essays, and on the right, a nice one by British sociologist of science. Misha Landau's classic and highly original work examined the structure of the scientific stories of human evolution in the early 20th century as hero myths, with the hero primitive man, gendered, overcoming obstacles, and being transformed into the fittest on the way to a happy ending, namely survival. The elements may be rearranged, but the framework is constant, a story about the heroic ancestors. These are not the kinds of stories we tell about the ancestors of Drosophila persimilis and Drosophila pseudo-obscura. 
These are our stories of our ancestors. Now, in any other society, the study of who we are and where we come from would be considered the domain of kinship and origin. In ours, it's science. In particular, the science of biological anthropology. This is a field that has been defined by two major discoveries in the last couple of centuries. First, in the 19th century, the discovery that we are descended from apes. And in the 20th century, the discovery that human variation and race are two very distinct domains, and studying one is quite different from studying the other. Now, I think it's a measure of how significant and meaningful these narratives of origin and kinship are, that they are aggressively opposed by large segments of society. We have racists rejecting our scientific narrative of who we are, and creationists rejecting our scientific narrative of where we come from. But they're not interested in the races of Drosophila or in its evolution. The point is that unlike other sciences, this one is engaged in a two-front culture war. And taking as our model the natural sciences is not going to help us, because they aren't engaged in a struggle over who gets to compose the authoritative scientific story of our natures and our origins. This is our special science, a science constrained by the data, but also affording a lot of built-in room to be creatively meaningful in ways that organic chemistry simply isn't and can never be. As humans, we seek meaning, but science offers only accuracy, or the closest available approximation thereof. And of course, we know that those accurate narratives invariably encode narratives of gender and race and power. Nor is it a particular embarrassment. It simply comes with the territory. After all, it would be nice not to be humans studying humans, which precludes objectivity, and to be able to study ourselves as one would study fruit flies, where there is nothing at stake which is why Thomas Huxley invented the pretend you're an alien trope. <coughs> Trying to convince his Victorian readership that they really are similar to apes, a theme I'll return to, he wants to tell you that the best way to classify humans is with the apes. But he appreciates that there is a subjective element involved in deciding your own position in the order of things. And he says, well, you don't have to take my word for this classification. If a space alien from the planet Saturn were here, that's just how he'd do it. Imagine yourself a scientific Saturnian, he writes, classifying this erect and featherless biped that some enterprising traveler has brought back in a cask of rum. They would certainly classify us with the apes. And perhaps they would. But you can see the problem with the argument a bit more readily when you see how the paleontologist Henry Fairfield Osborne utilized it a few decades later. If an unbiased zoologist, like me, <laughs> were to descend upon the Earth from Mars, where, by the way, we now know that the training they receive is vastly inferior to the training you get on Saturn, <laughs> he would undoubtedly divide the races of man into several genera and into a very large number of species and subspecies. <laughs> and somewhat later, Jared Diamond's muse is a bit more generic extraterrestrial, who is kind enough to give him the title for his book, which was kind of awful but nevertheless widely acclaimed, and finally, geneticist Steve Jones returns us to Mars, where DNA hybridization is widely used as a phylogenetic tool, as it was briefly on Earth in the 1980s. <laughs> it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there are two problems here. The first is obviously the substitution of science fiction for science in this argument, as if you know what Martians would do better than I know. But more importantly, <laughs> If there's one thing anthropologists have learned, it's that just on Earth, systems of classification are culture-bound, and people classify for diverse reasons and according to diverse criteria. The idea that anybody else out there would necessarily hit on phylogenetic classification as the best system because you have is a hell of an ethnocentrism. But it's an interesting situation when we can't tell the science fiction from the science because the scientists themselves are deliberately conflating the two in order to make rhetorical arguments on behalf of aspects of human evolution that they can't sustain by recourse to reality. This is about relations that may or may not be fictive. It's kinship. You see, Martians don't even bother trying to classify fruit flies. 
And this exposes the great paradox at the heart of anthropological science, namely that we are humans studying ourselves and there is no way out of that reflexive loop. Pretending to be a Martian is not part of the canon of scientific protocols. <laughs> On the other hand, we do want to be good Baconians and free ourselves of the biases, Francis Bacon called them idols, that produce inaccurate readings of nature. We want to be as scientific as possible. So we want our stories to conform generally to the rules and to be guided by what philosopher John Dupre calls the epistemic values of science. Things like the assumption that nature is something that can be bracketed and examined and discussed separately from the world of spirit and miracle. That theories are generally tweaked to fit the evidence rather than vice versa. That we can learn about nature by isolating it in microcosm under controlled conditions and generalize our results to the world at large. And of course, that accuracy is our transcendent goal and the surest path to it is the application of reason. And if you're all familiar with various critiques, feminist, post-colonial, etc., you know that those political lenses are always there in the science. And while it sometimes seems as though anthropologists eat our own ancestors, actually what we're doing is identifying and correcting the biases of earlier generations. So that even though our own work can never be value neutral, its embedded values can at least be more subtle and benign than those of earlier generations. As humans, we seek meaning in stories of kinship and ancestry. We want meaningful stories about who we are and where we come from. Again, science only offers accuracy. Of course, it's not that hard to imagine situations in which maximum accuracy might not be desirable, such as polite conversation. <laughs> Moreover, the power of science often lies in revealing not so much what nature is, as in helping us to make sense of what nature is like. For example, in the 17th century, it was widely imagined that the universe was like a giant machine. And that was certainly valuable, since you understand a machine by understanding the functions of its component parts. And that turned out to be a useful way of looking at the world, both mechanistically and theologically. But of course, the universe isn't really a machine. In the 19th century, and I think this is one of the most underappreciated aspects of his work, Charles Darwin undermined that very metaphor. After all, when Darwin was at Cambridge, he learned that an organism was like a watch, the opening lines of Paley's natural theology. But the argument that he makes in The Origin of Species is that a species is more like a subspecies or variety with a history and descent with modification than it is like machinery with an assembly. But of course, a variety is made in a sense by a breeder. Somebody actually selects, unlike nature. So once again, the metaphor eventually breaks down. And finally, Erwin Schrodinger suggested in the 1940s that it might be useful to think of heredity as if it were like coded information. And of course, the language metaphors became the hallmark of molecular biology. Transcription, translation, splicing, and a code. But again, it's not literally a code or language. Well, none of this is particularly earth-shattering. It's Science Studies 1A, the nature of scientific storytelling. And we don't teach it in science classes because it goes against the master narrative that science is entirely data-driven. And for those of you who are experimentalists, let me suggest a fun bit of empirical ethnographic research. Go up to a molecular biologist and explain that there is no genetic code literally. It is a metaphor thought up by a physicist in the 1940s. My hypothesis <laughs> is that they will look at you like you just killed their puppy. <laughs> and then after composing themselves, they'll call you anti-science. <laughs> And in exactly the same vein, when I say evolution is a sacred narrative, if you don't believe me, just go up to a biologist and deny it. And you'll find out quickly how sacred it is. We own this story, who we are and where we come from. And even though everybody feels as though they own a piece of it, from entomologists to evolutionary psychologists, it is ours. We are its custodians. Because we control the data the study of human diversity and ancestry and the behavior and evolution of our closest relatives, the primates. And of course, the stories we tell are necessarily constrained by those data, primatology, paleoanthropology, ethnography, human biology. 
and those are our data. We're the ones most familiar with their limitations and the appropriate contexts of their deployment. The point I'm working towards is that although we are constructing mythological stories about the ancestors, ours is not just a made-up story. It is constrained. But the data that constrain it are points. They're dots. And of course, the dots come from somewhere and have to be connected. Storytelling is not an appendage to human evolution. It is human evolution. And the reason it is human evolution is that it is human nature to the extent that anything can be said to be human nature. Now, evolution leaves two reciprocal patterns, continuity and discontinuity. That is to say, regardless of whether nature makes leaps, a point Huxley and Darwin disagreed on, the trail of descent is a continuous one, for every organism had two parents. The discontinuities emerge from divergences in ecological adaptation, mate recognition systems, or genomic structure, and allow us to identify two groups of organisms as different in the first place. Darwin called it descent with modification. Some people focus on the descent. Some people focus on the modification. I want to focus on the with. To focus on the modification or discontinuity alone leaves you unable to contextualize the origin of the human condition, whatever that condition is. But focusing solely on the descent or continuity is at least as bad. That's what I'm talking about here. First of all, continuity with the apes does not automatically imply descent from them. They recognized that biological similarity even in the classical world, but didn't worry too much about it. A Roman poet named Quintus Ennius observed how similar we are to the horrid monkeys. And although his works are lost, the saying was preserved in the works of Cicero, universally studied by Latin students for centuries. So when this new thing, science, comes around, it's quoted in two of the big works, Francis Bacon's Novum Organum and Linnaeus's Systema Naturae. Linnaeus's bold move to classify all species according to their similarity in structure to other species rather than by their similarity to people necessitated classifying us with the monkeys, apes, and lemurs a century before the meaning of that pattern became understandable as a trail of common ancestry. So the similarity of human to anthropoids is thus not a big surprise, but it must become a linchpin of Darwinism if we ever want to convince anyone about the literal genealogical descent from those creatures. And by the middle of the 19th century, the discontinuities between species were not contested. In earlier ages, when the great chain of being was the dominant model of nature, there might have been some disagreement over whether everything integrates into everything else or not. But since the late 18th century, the taxonomists, led by Linnaeus, were giving every species its own pigeonhole. By the mid-19th century, naturalists took the discreteness of species for granted. What the early Darwinians were faced with was reestablishing the continuity between species, particularly ourselves and everything else. The problem was trying to convince European readers that they were descended from apes in the absence of a fossil record attesting to it. And this rhetorical problem was solved by Ernst Haeckel in his 1868 exposition of Darwinism. And here on the front of piece, he shows you why we don't need a fossil record, for the continuity between Europeans and apes is provided by the living non-European peoples of the world. And even though this illustration, or its even worse revision, did not make it into the widely read English translation of the work, The History of Creation, there was no ambiguity as the English text faithfully presented the continuity between what Haeckel called the lowest woolly-haired races and the highest man-like apes. Now we know that origin narratives carry political weight. We know that archaeology is routinely utilized in the service of nationalism, and there's politics in deep history as well. Haeckel created continuity between human and ape where there, in fact, isn't any and dehumanized most of the peoples of the world in the service of bashing the creationists. And in so doing, he incurred a debt that serious students of human evolution will have to be paying off forever. And that debt is to be responsible stewards of the sacred narrative. Or, in less relativistic terms, 
to maintain an engagement with ethical and humanistic issues while we engage with the science of human evolution. Nevertheless, since that first generation of Darwinians, we've tended to find greater scientific value in the continuities of human and ape than in the discontinuities. The value is the same as it ever was, rhetorical and instrumental. The problem is that it lets the creationists drive the scientific agenda, and in some cases drive it off a cliff. The continuity is there, but it is at best, even if you get it right, only half of the story. So let me digress slightly at this point. About 20 years ago, I was fortunate enough to have been invited into a small colloquium given by Jane Goodall. Goodall, of course, has been emphasizing the mental and behavioral continuity between chimpanzees and humans for over half a century, now in the service of conservation, and presented the chimps that way in her talk. At the end, a psychologist asked her whether her conceptions of the chimpanzee mind as essentially smaller than the mind of a human might be slightly misleading. Were there not ways in which the chimpanzee's mind might be seen as simply different from the human, not less than the human, where the Venn diagrams of their minds might not overlap, since they are, after all, different species? And Goodall thought for a second and said, no, I've been watching the chimps for decades now, and I just don't see the ways in which their minds and behaviors are actually qualitatively different from ours. At which point, a voice came from the back of the room, not mine, I hasten to add, <laughs> saying, what about estrus? Or estrus, if you're from a different part of the Anglophone world, referring to the fact that sexual activity in chimpanzees is generally stimulated by the purple and pink swelling of the female's perineum, indicating visually to the community that she is fertile and a great deal of frantic sexual activity, otherwise rare, ensues. And Goodall thought about it for a second and replied, well, yes, there's that. She was so committed to the narrative of continuity that she was blind to the discontinuities that she had actually written about. So here for more, that, that story really flopped, didn't it? OK. Maybe this one will be better. Here for a more recent example. The paleontologist and science editor Henry G is keen to dethrone humans and deny our species any exceptional status. The history of life told by other organisms, he writes, might have different priorities. <laughs> Giraffe scientists would no doubt write of evolutionary progress in terms of lengthening necks rather than larger brains or tool making skill. So much for human superiority. But let's pause just a second. He has created an imaginary universe of giraffe scientists who require neither large brains to think scientific thoughts nor hands to write them down. <laughs> Impressive abilities in an artiodactyl. For you see, he has to invent human giraffes in order to dethrone human humans. This is not about the empirics of human evolution. It's about the hermeneutics. Another way of imposing continuity is to redraw the playing field, so that instead of linking us to the apes, we declare ourselves to be apes. Maybe gussied up a bit, maybe naked, but we are apes of some sort. That's our identity. We are apes. Take that, creationists. <laughs> and that, says this fruit fly geneticist, is an indisputable fact. So far be it from me to dispute it, but it is hard to reconcile to George Gaylord Simpson's mid-century pronouncement, it is not a fact that man is an ape, extra tricks or no. And Simpson was a meticulous writer and an inspiration of mine, so when he's telling you this in monosyllables, that means he thinks it's important. <laughs> now, Simpson right here is echoing a sentiment of the biologist Julian Huxley who had ridiculed the idea that we are apes as representative of the nothing but school. Those, for instance, who on realizing that man is descended from a primitive ancestor, say that he is only a developed monkey. <laughs> I have no idea what he actually said. <laughs> he had a celebrated grandfather, but he knew that your identity, what you are, is more than what your ancestors were. I mean, my ancestors were peasants. But if you call me a peasant on that basis, I would take some umbrage. 
<laughs> and my more, my more remote ancestors were slaves. Some people's more recent ancestors were slaves. And if you call us slaves on that basis, frankly, fuck you. <laughs> there, I said it. But notice how we entered the realm of biopolitics very quickly, didn't we? I mean, we aren't reducible to our ancestors. Huxley and Simpson didn't think so. In fact, revolutions were fought over that very point. The idea that you are just your ancestry is the folk biological bedrock of the politics of hereditary aristocracy. <laughs> Which is not to say that the geneticist is a royalist or oppressor of the masses, which he might be. But just to point out that the simple scientific statement that we are apes is loaded with value. And that it articulates a non-empirical assumption that who we are is reducible to what our ancestors were, which we reject in other contexts. Why on earth should we accept it in this one? Perhaps we can answer that question by raising another question, namely cui bono or who gains by reducing identity, what we are, to ancestry, what we were, aside, of course, from the aristocrats. Well, genetics has always been much better at detecting ancestry than at detecting novelty. Huxley and Simpson knew that. We've known for over a century that, for example, the bloods of human and chimpanzee are more similar to one another than are the bloods of horse and donkey, which are nevertheless capable of hybridization. But nobody called us apes on that basis because they didn't think that your ancestry and your identity were the same. Simpson made it clear in this 1962 paper. We evolved from apes, of course, but we became different from them. That is to say, we evolved. In fact, if you think of evolution as Darwin and Simpson did as descent with modification, then to call us apes is to deny evolution. It's descent without modification. Human evolution incorporates a great deal of modification, physically, ecologically, behaviorally, but not very much genetically. And that's why we can use genetic change as a sort of clock, precisely because it doesn't record in any readily retrievable way the physical, ecological, and behavioral changes that make us not apes. The meaning of that fact started to get queried in the early 1960s as biochemist Emil Zuckerkandl showed that the structure of human hemoglobin and gorilla hemoglobin differed from one another only minimally. Thus, from the point of view of hemoglobin, he argued, gorilla is just an abnormal human, or man an abnormal gorilla, and the two species form actually one continuous population. But is that sanguinary continuity with the gorilla transcendent or illusory? After all, cannot any reasonably observant person distinguish a human from a gorilla quite readily? The paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson, whom I quote a lot because he pretty much embodied normative evolutionary biology in the 20th century, challenged the point of view of hemoglobin, which fails to distinguish humans from gorillas. From any point of view other than that properly specified, that is, of course, nonsense. What the comparison really seems to indicate is that hemoglobin is a bad choice and has nothing to tell us about affinities or indeed tells us a lot. In other words, if you can't tell the human from the ape, as the old timers would say, then you probably shouldn't be a biologist. <laughs> Here's a hint. The human is probably the one walking and talking, and the ape is probably the one sleeping naked in trees and flinging its poo. <laughs> the domain where it's difficult to tell them apart is science fiction. <laughs> now, let me make it clear, nobody likes apes more than I do. This is not about whether I'm better than them, it's about whether I'm one of them or whether I'm different from them. It's not about planes of existence, but about adaptive divergences. Genetics shows the similarity of human and ape genomes particularly well. And one could say that we actually became apes with the popular genetic reductionism that accompanied the Human Genome Project a couple of decades ago. Some of you older folks might remember this genre of purple pop science from a quarter century ago, mapping the code, coding the map, and the like. What changed was not the discovery that we are apes, but the normative value placed on genetic data, which show that 
genetically, we are apes. Which all goes to show that the statement that we are apes is a powerful narrative about human ancestry and its relationship to human nature. But it does not articulate a fact of nature, but rather a fact of nature culture. Privileging certain kinds of scientific data and meanings over others. Importantly, privileging continuity and downplaying emergence in spite of the fact that both are there, dialectically constructing our identity. Now, <clears throat> there's another way in which one could argue that we are apes, phylogenetic. We fall naturally in the midst of a group of species constituted by the word apes. So in that sense, we might be apes. What is an ape, anyway? Well, the term encompasses the orangutan of Southeast Asia, and it encompasses the chimpanzee of Africa. But we humans are more closely related to that chimpanzee than the chimpanzee is to that orangutan. So if the word ape is to mean something phylogenetic, then we fall within the group comprised by that term, and we are apes. Fortunately, it doesn't mean something phylogenetic. Ape is a contrast term to human. The superfamily hominoidea is composed of apes and humans. Not just apes, you can look it up. <laughs> but wait a second, as long as I brought up the question what is an ape in the context of a descriptive category that is not a phylogenetic category, let me ask a parallel question. What is a monkey? The term encompasses the New World or Platyrrhine monkeys, like this highly endangered Muriqui of Brazil. And it encompasses critters of the Old World, like baboons and this rhesus macaque. But we humans are more closely related to that rhesus macaque than the rhesus macaque is to the New World monkey. So if the word monkey is to mean something phylogenetic, then we fall within the group comprised by that term, and we are monkeys. Fortunately, it doesn't mean something phylogenetic. And while we're at it, what is a prosimian? That term encompasses the lemurs of Madagascar, as well as the tarsier of the Philippines. But we humans are more closely related to that tarsier than the tarsier is to that lemur. So if the word prosimian is to have a phylogenetic meaning, then we fall within the group comprised by that term, and we are prosimians. But fortunately, it doesn't mean something phylogenetic. Wait, there's more. What is a fish? <laughs> the term encompasses the tuna as well as the coelacanth. <laughs> but we humans are more closely related to that coelacanth than the coelacanth is to the tuna. So if the word fish is to have a phylogenetic meaning, then we fall within the group comprised by that, and we are fish. And that is a very different statement than saying that our ancestors were fish, or prosimians, or monkeys, or apes, which of course they were. There is certainly something to be learned from our fish ancestry, such as why we gestate in an aqueous saline environment. But to say that we are fish is silly. Our ancestors evolved into land-dwelling, air-breathing tetrapods. What we are is ex-fish. Likewise, our more recent ancestors diverged from the apes and evolved into walking, talking people. What are we? We are not apes as our ancestors were. We are ex-apes. That's evolution. Calling us fish or apes is a trivial statement about the way those colloquial groups are composed and constructed. And I apologize for this word up front, paraphyletically, and not a profound statement about our natures. You see, if you want to argue on the basis of phylogenetic relations that we are fish and prosimians and monkeys and apes simultaneously, which is what the phylogenetic argument that we are apes implies, then you, have, then you simply defeated the purpose of classifying. So to recap, there are five reasons to call us apes, all of them wrong. <laughs> First, to call us apes helps us bash the creationists. Except that emphasizing continuity at the expense of discontinuity misrepresents the biology, has a terrible track record, and lets the creationists drive the scientific agenda. What could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> there are simply better ways to bash the creationists. Second, it shows how unexceptional we are. But to whom? Apes don't care how unexceptional we are. Everybody thinking about and reading about that issue is human. 
That fact alone establishes our exceptionalism. <laughs> Moreover, the same people maintaining our unexceptionalism will often turn around and bemoan the environmental degradation of the ape habitat that humans are wreaking. And that's a fact. Humans are driving apes to extinction by habitat destruction, not vice versa. But to acknowledge it involves acknowledging the exceptionalism that they are denying. The apes aren't driving each other to extinction. We are driving them. Third, it reduces identity to ancestry, which is fine if you want to defend feudalism or the caste system, but that puts you in a biopolitical position that is difficult to defend in the modern age. Those of us who engage on a regular basis with scientific racism know how significant the claim that you are reducible to your ancestry is. Indeed, it's a position that the scientist does not want to have to defend morally, because we now recognize it as odious. And fourth, the cladistic argument that reduces evolution to phylogeny or descent with modification to just descent indicated that we fall within the group comprised by the apes, but the argument that it makes us apes is exactly the same argument that makes us fish. It's a trivial statement about the non-phylogenetic composition of those groups. Not too many Don Knotts fans here. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, um, in the last few weeks on social media, notably the fabulous Bioanthro News Facebook page, I have seen physical anthropologists avow that they are apes with such vehemence that eventually I've had to break down and concede, all right, you've convinced me that you're an ape. <laughs> Although I can't guarantee that the linguistic message I sent and the one they received were necessarily the same one. After all, the word ape is not a value neutral term, is it? In the second person, you are an ape, it connotes a rhetorical state of subhumanity. In the first person, I am an ape, it connotes a rhetorical state of unexceptionalism. There is actually quite a bit of anthropology here, and only a little bit of it is biological. The statement that we are apes, then, may be a fact, but it is certainly disputable, it's not manifestly true, and it isn't a necessary implication of evolution. It's a historically produced fact, the result of choosing to privilege genetic knowledge and relationships over other kinds of scientific knowledge and relationships. What you see genetically is how similar we are genetically to the apes, who live more or less like our ancestors did five million years ago. It's not really about what we are, but about what scientific data we use to tell the story of what we are, and especially about the meaning we impart to the relationship between descent and identity. So perhaps a half hour was a bit too much to spend analyzing the title of my book. <laughs> I've spoken about evolution for all this time without mentioning a single bone tool or DNA sequence. I'm interested in the bigger frame. And one of the most important elements in the authoritative story of our nature and origins is the relative balance that we ascribe to descent and modification in the construction of that narrative. We're neither apes nor angels, but people, with apes for ancestors and perhaps aspirations to be angels. And this is not the domain of zoology, and a lifetime of zoological training cannot prepare you for the responsibilities incurred in curating, in a responsible and scholarly fashion, the authoritative scientific story of who we are and where we come from. And it's kind of ironic that this is a lesson for working on human evolution because it's also a reasonable lesson to be taken from the text of Genesis. So let me finish with a little sermon. Adam and Eve are in a garden world without good and evil, that is to say, in a baby-like or animal-like state. Eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what made them different from other life in the creation and occupation of a moral universe in addition to the physical universe, beginning with the recognition that it's wrong to be naked in public. Once they enter that moral universe, there's no turning back. It's the world of adulthood of right and wrong, of good and evil. The things you have to know in order for us to allow you to remain with us. Amorality is no longer an option. Perhaps sometimes excusable in children, animals, or strangers, or mythic ancestors. Immorality, 
like killing your brother and lying about it, the very next story is not an option either. What's left is the moral life broader than the particular concerns of Bronze Age shepherds. Namely, you have to learn right from wrong and do what's right, or else you are not wanted here or anywhere. And that lesson is as applicable to modern age scientists as it is to Bronze Age shepherds. Thank you.